So, Mark, I was this many years old when I found out that Las Vegas Harry Reid Airport has bats. Apparently, Mexican free-tail bats took up residence there 20 years ago in the employee parking garage. And I guess you can see them flying in and out of there all the time. Yeah, talk about creepy. Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't want to watch them. But this reminds me of what is like Austin, where they all come out from under the bridge and people like actually travel there to see it. So... Maybe this will be the new hot spot in Vegas to go check out the bats flying out in, at sunset. It just reminds you, no matter how much you know about a place, there's always things to learn. Uh, they tweeted this out, and I, like I said, I had absolutely no idea. I've never seen bats in Las Vegas proper, although I've seen them, plenty of them, out at the railroad trail out near Lake Mead, and it's a really cool place to do that. They have all the old railroad tunnels that you can hike through, bats everywhere. Of course, uh, you got to watch no. out for the droppings. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, new Sphere news or Madison Square Garden news, and actually it's not related to the Sphere other than they need money to pay for this thing, so they have to start selling off assets, and uh, the Tao Nightclub Group is being sold by MSG, or at least, what, 66.9% of the group, and uh, it's going to be sold for $550 million. The sale is going to close in May, and uh, they have over 80 locations in uh, 20 markets on four different continents. So this is a worldwide brand. In Las Vegas, you would know they have Tao, Hakkasan, Omnia at Caesars Palace, Lavo at Palazzo, Marquis, and Beauty and Essex at Cosmopolitan. So a lot of uh, adult-oriented places here in Las Vegas. And the, the sphere <laughs> strikes again. That cost overruns, they're killing it. Yeah, you know, what's the number one rule in investing? Like, don't put all your eggs in one basket. And it's it's like they're selling off pieces right and left to, to put all their eggs in this one sphere-shaped basket, which, you know, I hope it works out for them. I'm skeptical that it will long-term. Like, I, it'll get built, it'll open, and I think it'll be kind of, it'll be cool. I just don't know that they ever recoup all this investment in a meaningful way, but, you know, it'll be crazy to see along the way. I think they took their position in Tao in 2017, so they haven't been the, you know, long-term owners of this brand, and I wouldn't expect any changes in the short term uh, as another hospitality group takes over, but uh, long term you might see some changes in the venues and maybe an expansion, we'll see, but already a, a very big name worldwide and in Las Vegas, and uh, it's not going to be part of Madison Square Garden anymore. Uh, when they announced they were splitting up the company, this part of the company, Tao, was going to go with the Sphere in the Sphere Entertainment side. So clearly this money will go towards the company that operates the Sphere, not the other split off of Madison Square Garden. So yeah, uh, cost overruns. The Sphere is, uh, like I said, they're, they're hurting, but uh, I guess it's good for them that they're able to get the funds. They're going to get this thing built and charge their $150 movie ticket prices. For hour movies. They don't even do the three-hour movies there. Just uh, just an hour. And people pointed out, and I and we failed to say this, but uh, it's it's obvious. They're using Ticketmaster, so those tickets we talked about for their movie do not include the Ticketmaster fees, oh, which in some cases were like another $30 on the most expensive <laughs> tickets. So, uh, yeah, so we actually underplayed what the actual cost is of those movies. Yeah, get them uh, on the resale. They're going to be at Tickets for Less in no time. Now, uh, Vegas Eater had a first look inside the Tiki Bar at Resorts World that we talked about a few weeks ago, and uh, this is basically an overlay on the bar that was already there as part of their flagship restaurant, Genting Palace. But as part of the renovations, they got rid of the entrance to Genting Palace, making them separate venues, which I think is a great idea. They also spruced up the place with a lot of decor. You're gonna have all the drinks you would expect at a tiki bar, you know, the special glasses, all of that stuff for the, what, fish-shaped mugs, all that stuff, but it does Thank look like was. a tiki, yeah, like a tiki overlay, though, on yeah. a bar. So. I think like true tiki lovers are going to be a little bit skeptical of this. I am skeptical. I don't. I don't love it. Like it's still a beautiful looking bar, and I do agree. Separating the two makes a lot of sense. One, if you're in a fine dining place, you don't want to be looking at people in a tiki bar. And opposite end of that, if you just want to go have a drink and have some fun, you don't want to look at a fine dining establishment. It, you know they don't vibe very well. But it looks like an a, a high end Asian bar that they put tiki motifs in there and like hung some stuff on the walls. It still is a really beautiful looking place. It just doesn't scream tiki to me. It screams tiki light or like they just wallpapered over it real quick. Uh, so, I mean, the drinks will probably be good and that's probably the most important thing. But you go to like, you know, the other tiki bars in, in Vegas and it's like the whole thing is encompassing 
and you go to this one and it's like, oh, we have Tiki Touches, you know, like a section of Pier 1 or something. Is Pier 1 even around? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if they're still around. <laughs> no, I, I, I totally agree. Although, like, if you're going to put a Tiki Bar in a place like Resorts World, I feel like this is about as good as you're going to get. And we knew that the switchover was only going to take a couple weeks, so they weren't going to do major renovations. And as you said, this is one of the more beautiful spots in Resorts World before that. So the base level... Uh, bar was really nice, uh, but you're not going to get anything crazy. I think the one part I didn't love is where they covered up the entrance to the restaurant. They put some like wood veneer stuff and some surfboards that looked a little weird or out of place to me. Uh, I did like the window that overlooks the Hilton lobby. They put in some like, I don't know, foliage and, and stuff like that. Uh, so you're going to get a little bit of a tiki experience. It's not going to be golden tiki, as you said. Kind of a callback to our restrooms episode. A lot of people said in the uh, comments there, that the restrooms at Golden Tiki over in Chinatown are the best it's a bit in Las Vegas. Pornographic. We can't. <laughs> I was going to say we can't really talk about them, but if you want to Google what they what they look like, you sure can. Uh, but I did want to give a shout out to those restrooms because people did mention them. I, I will not show them here on the show, though. <laughs> yeah, we don't want to get kicked off of YouTube. Now the Vegas Golden Knights are in the playoffs, Mark, and uh, they're playing the Winnipeg Jets. Unfortunately, as we record this, they lost game one, uh, five to one, but uh, game two is going to be done before this comes out. But game four, they're going to do a free viewing party at Stadium Swim, and all you need to do is wear your Vegas Golden Knights gear, and you get in for free, and uh, you can watch game four on the big 143-foot screen. And uh, so it's a nice way to get up there, I guess, for free. Uh, Otherwise, I was on their site. It looked like you could still reserve tickets for 20 bucks, but then it said... If you wear your gear, you get in free. So I don't know how it works if you're going to be able to swim or just watch the game. Yeah, it's a cool setup, and it's definitely a cool place to to watch a game, especially this time of year where it's really nice at night, not too hot. Uh, So if you want to go swim, maybe you can reserve it and then get refunded. I'm not not sure exactly how that works. Maybe you want to call if, if you're thinking about it. But even if you want to just go hang out and you don't even care about the nights and just be in the atmosphere, this is kind of a cool way to get in. I'm sure you can find a cheaper than $20 hat or shirt around town, you know, at one of those souvenir shops and wear that in and, and get like a discounted entry price by it, even if you're not a fan. And I have been able to watch a Golden Knights game there on the screen. It really is incredible to watch sports on that screen, especially when they have one game on the entire screen. They have audio everywhere. So it feels like you're watching it in your living room with a 143 foot screen. Uh, so yeah, it, it's an incredible experience and fun. And I'm, I'm assuming you're going to be able to swim, which would make it even cooler. The water's heated Nice and comfortable, like 91 degrees, Uh, so check it out. We missed this last week, so I just wanted to say it really quick. Not a lot to say, but Katy Perry announced a huge tour, and she's going to create a new album and doing all of that. So her final Resorts World residency dates, the tickets are on sale now. She'll be there October 4th through November 4th, and then she previously had May 12th through August 12th on her schedule as well. And then she's done, at least for the foreseeable future, at Resorts World as she goes and makes new music. I guess this is sort of the trade-off of having very current artists doing residencies because eventually they're going to want to go make new music. Yeah, you don't have to worry about that with Usher. But um... (laughs) (laughs) Trigger Usher fans everywhere. But no, uh, I was kind of surprised like how final it felt when they announced it. Like she's ending her residency instead of just like saying it's going on a pause or whatever and with how successful it's been and i'm assuming how much money she's made i'm kind of surprised by that like i get going out and touring and you know selling your new music but you think like a year later after you've done that tour you come back and and do something in vegas so hopefully there's something in the future because everything we heard was the show was really great so hopefully they they work it out going forward but like you said that's kind of the downside of this and where you get people for here and there and it might not match up with your trip Versus like a Celine Dion who's there all year round. And you know when you go to Vegas, you can go see her and and stuff like that. So it's a give and take, but it's cool. It gives you something different than what you're used to for sure. Very well-reviewed show. So if you want to go see it, if she ever comes back to Las Vegas, it probably won't be that show. So recommend going there if you want to see her before the end of the year. Now, I did talk uh, last week saying I was trying to go to Esther's Kitchen in the Arts District. I did get in there. It's very hard to get reservations there, especially for brunch and for dinner on most nights. And if you walk up, you're going to want to do it early. And then you're going to be kind of relegated to the back area where they have tent dining, which for me is like a bonus, right? So we got there last Friday night and we put our name in, you know, around 530, I think. And they said it was about an hour and 45 minutes to get in. Indeed, it was like exactly that. And they also said we had to sit in the tents. And uh, like I said, I was excited for the tents. So I was very happy about that. 
I feel like tents is an upsell to me. I don't, especially this time of year. Yeah, the weather was beautiful. So they have a back patio area with some tables and then they have a bunch of tents. And then they have the main dining room, which is very small. Now Esther's Kitchen is in the process of relocating to a building next door, which I think is about twice the size, but uh, I don't think there's a firm date on when they're gonna move in there. Um, but yeah, this restaurant really does live up to the hype. This was my first time eating there. Everything is homemade. They're pizza, their pasta. They have the best sourdough bread as they are known for, and it really lives up to the hype. But the pasta was great. The food was great. The atmosphere was great. Service was really great. And she was just saying how hard it is to get in there, the server. She says she can't even get a brunch reservation for herself. That's how hard brunch is. And then on most nights, they're turning away people to get in to eat as well, even on, during the week. And the other interesting thing she said was on any given night, she might have a couple locals come in, but for the most part, tourists are keeping this place going. Yeah, I am surprised because the, where it's located in the Arts District, it, I mean, it's touristy, but it's not a mainstay for tourists. I feel like it's a good mix of locals, so I'm kind of surprised by that. In your pictures and everything I saw, the pasta looks amazing. It looks just like what you'd get in Italy. Uh, the, the pizza looked a little doughy for me, but I know you say... It's sourdough, and it has too much green stuff on it, uh, so that that's a problem I'm going to fight about. But uh, I, I would love to try it to, to have that sourdough flavor. It's something you don't really get with pizza anywhere else, so I think it'd be kind of a cool, unique taste uh, take on it. Um, so I'd definitely give it a try. It looks amazing. Yeah, one of the interesting things is they have the sourdough bread, and they serve it with butter, but you can order this, like, different spreads to go on the bread, so we sort of shared it as a table. Our friends and us, uh, I think it was $29 for the full selection of spreads, and it had everything from, like, a liver one to anchovy butter to some interesting ones, a beet-based one. Most of them were good. Some of them weren't popular. Believe it or not, the anchovy butter was the winner for me. It was so good. Uh, that's the one I would probably just go single out if I was going to go order one. But I think it's free if you just get the bread and the butter uh, along with entrees and stuff. And the pizza, yeah, it's sourdough crust. And uh, that green on top is arugula, Mark, so it's not kale. So uh, It said kale paying. in the article, but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> well, that particular pizza that I'm showing here was arugula. The one that you're throwing and, uh, up on the screen? <laughs> <laughs> See? <laughs> See, I'm learning. I'm learning. I'm learning. Uh, but yeah, the Arts District in general, it really is beautiful what they've done there. Basically, this is going to be south of Charleston between Maine and Casino Center. And in some cases, you know, you could say it goes almost all the way south to Strat. Although, you know, really it's going to go three or four blocks is the heart of it south of Charleston. And, you know, there's restaurants like Casa Don Juan that have been there for a long time. Lots of breweries, lots of really cool little bars in like back alleys and stuff like that. Street art everywhere. Of course, in uh, like sort of a hipster way, they have vintage clothing stores, tattoo parlors. It's just a very kind of up and coming, interesting area with a lot of cool little businesses. And on a Friday night, you know, I was expecting it to be a little busier, but it wasn't that busy down there. Even as it got later, I saw some bars that were sitting sort of empty, which kind of was concerning. We know we had a meetup at Three Sheets Craft Beer Bar, which closed last year. So we know not all the businesses are thriving there, even if Esther's is doing really good but we took a walk around and it just as we walked towards like third street and uh, kind of closer to las vegas boulevard it just reminded me that a decade ago you would have never really wanted to walk around this area and now it's very nice and uh, we stumbled across silver stamp my friend had been there before and this bar apparently has been around a long time and i don't know how to describe it it's definitely a dive bar but then they have all this it's a midwest, weird decor. It's a midwest dive bar that's what i'm gonna tell you wood paneling on the walls <laughs> drop ceilings dark it's Midwest, baby. Yeah, they have like the old lampshades. They have this weird doll display with lights. They have a claw machine or they have a vending machine that has like mystery things you can get in it. A wall of different obscure beer cans. So much stuff. Uh, there is a lot of video that I will put up on the screen for you guys to see to kind of describe this better. <laughs> but uh, this, is a, uh, this is a great area and there's just so much to discover. There's a lot of cool little bars and there's alleyways because this is an older area of Las Vegas. You don't see alleys a lot of the time in Las Vegas, but there's alleyways and there's bars in there. And like I said, there's even the Elvis uh, Chapel around there if you want to get married. So uh, this is an area to go check out, have some dinner at Esther's Kitchen or another one of the restaurants down there have a few drinks at some of the bars or the breweries, walk around. It's beautiful. And I feel like this is the nicest area of Las Vegas as far as that type of stuff goes. East Fremont for me has jumped the shark a little bit. It's just a little bit too rowdy down there. Still very nice, but this is what I think maybe East Fremont was when it started to develop. And I hope it kind of re retains this character long term. Yeah, I've only spent a couple days, you know, a few hours in Arts District and I loved it. And it, does, it gives you more of like a city vibe you expect when you go visit other towns and they have like this these little pocket neighborhoods that you can just walk around and check out different bars 
which I mean, you can do like on the strip and stuff going from casino to casino, but you don't really get that local vibe. And a lot of people like to say Vegas doesn't have an identity. It doesn't have a vibe. It's just, you know, all these chain restaurants or famous chefs bring it in. And I think this is that spot that you can go if you want more of the authentic local independently owned places. And the, you know, the, the silver stamp looks amazing. I definitely got to check it out. They have pickle and chips for $3 on the menu, which is like my favorite snack ever. You put the pickle in the middle of the two chips and it's like, it'll blow your mind. So I got to go check that out. But yeah, I just, if I'm going to go bar hop, that's kind of the area I would want to go. It'd be It'd be fun, and, and you get to hang out with locals and see some tourists, but you get to check out all these independently owned places that have unique spirit. So I I can't recommend it enough for people to head down there. And one more last note on Esther's Kitchen. The prices are definitely lower than you would see on the Strip. Um, so for especially when you're considering everything is like market to table, freshly made, you know, entrees, you're looking at like 18 to $30, which is pretty good uh, for all of that. So uh Definitely check that out. That's a slice of pizza at your uh, local food hall. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, Mark, in the big story of the week, the Las Vegas Athletics. The A's have announced that they're coming to Las Vegas, or at least they've come to agreement on a 49-acre parcel uh, to build a stadium, a $1.5 billion stadium, and they're buying this. Now, this isn't the site of the Rio. This isn't the Las Vegas Festival Grounds. It's not the Tropicana. It's not the old Win West site. It's not any of the other sites. It's the old Wild Wild West site on Tropicana, where uh, Red Rock Resorts tore down Wild Wild West, said they're going to redevelop it. They have about 100 acres there, so they're selling about 50 acres. The team has the option to buy another eight acres in the future, but that means that Red Rock Resorts is going to retain 40 to 50 acres to build something pretty smart. You know, get them to build a stadium, and then you can build a property next to it. Uh, there's a lot to be said about this. Not a big surprise, but uh, they've come out. The A's have confirmed this. The Oakland mayor came out with a scathing response, but they basically said after 20 years of trying to get a stadium done in Oakland, they're done. Las Vegas is it. Yeah, and that the Oakland mock-up that we showed, you know, a couple months ago on the river in Oakland looked pretty amazing. So uh, that would have been cool if they pulled it off. But this is this is great for Vegas. I really was hoping for the Rio spot. I thought that would have been a really unique, cool fit to have, and then Rio right there. But Hopefully they end up building something with that extra land so you have a property kind of attached. And I know they talked about walkways from T-Mobile over. They got to build. Like, that should be demanded by city council that that gets put in, you know, because you have this foot traffic. Allegiant didn't do it so well. So I'm hoping that they do something here when they build it. Like, build the walkway first and then build the stadium so people can easily access it. But, yeah, I think this is cool. You know, I, the one worry is can Vegas support all these sports franchises? They've done well so far, but... You know, as you add more and more, it's tough. And once the newness of a stadium wears off, you know, what kind of support do you see? I know you have outside support coming to visit Vegas all the time, which helps prop it up. But wh where does that look in five years, you know, between these three teams? Yeah, it'll be interesting. I do think this site is probably the best. I mean, they're rebuilding the Tropicana Interchange right now, uh, which will be able to handle more traffic. To your point, it's not a great pedestrian solution. With Allegiant, they had Hacienda Avenue. They already had a bridge there and that they just closed that during games. And it serves pretty good. You can walk out of Mandalay Bay and walk right or Luxor and walk right over the bridge. So that made sense, not needing a pedestrian bridge since they're using basically a car bridge for that. But you can't really use the Tropicana overpass. It's so busy. It's not going to be, it's not going to work. And, you know, building that pedestrian bridge from T-Mobile, it connects the stadiums and the park and all of that stuff there. So I think that would be a great idea. And to your point, I think it's required. Absolutely. Uh, so yeah, the A's land uh, is going to be bordered by Dean Martin Drive to the east, Tompkins Avenue to the north, Prokin Street to the west, and Tropicana to the south. So that's exactly where it's going to be. Like I said, Red Rock Resorts will retain some of the land there. And, uh, you know, all these stadiums are going to be about a mile apart from each other. This is about a mile north of Allegiant Stadium. So it's creating sort of a stadium district. But the big question mark, how do they pay for it? Governor Joe Lombardo said that he will not raise taxes to do this. So what are they going to do? They're just going to give them about $500 million in tax breaks, or at least that's the proposal. <laughs> well, well, that's the we'll proposal. Raise not taxes. Yet. We'll lower taxes for everybody else. Uh, yeah, so they're gonna. it's going to come out of your guys' pocket in some way, you know, or somehow. It's the only way to get it done, I guess. But hopefully you make the money back, you know, and jobs and, and new businesses and all that stuff that builds up around it. They always sell that. It never works that way, but... We shall see there. Now, are you surprised, like, that neither team changed names? Would you have liked that? I mean, it, I understand with the proximity to California and 
you know, you're still trying to get those fans to come. You don't really want to change the name, but we've seen it like when the Browns went to Baltimore, they changed to the Ravens, but then the St. Louis Rams went to LA, didn't change. So it's always curious, like, would you have rather had like a homegrown team that has their own name, like the Knights, or do you not really care? Yeah, this is an interesting question. I think they should change the name. Now with the Raiders, they had all that baked in history and a lot of fandom. The A's aren't as well supported. I would like to see them change the name when they come to Las Vegas. Uh, I don't think they've announced what they're going to do yet, but that would be a good solution. And uh, I hope that they do that. I mean, the Rams sort of made sense. The Rams were in LA before, so they were already a, a team. But you know, Las Vegas, I feel like we need our own identity. We have the right to, to have a team. I mean, athletics is a great generic sort of name. It's not like it doesn't really fit. It fits anywhere, right? But yeah, I'd love to see a new name there. And uh, you know, this is gonna be a retractable roof stadium or partially retractable roof. So state of the art. And uh, I, like I said, I think this location is probably the best of all the ones that they mentioned other than maybe the Tropicana site, but uh, I'm glad that the Trop is uh, getting a reprieve and maybe Bally's will start working on that redo uh, soon. The the Vegas Gamblers with an old school G on the hat. There you go. There you go. So uh, yeah, let us know what you guys think. Are you guys excited about the athletics finally coming out and saying Las Vegas is it? I have to think they have some backroom deals or they have some assurances that they'll be able to get that you know, that tax rebate thing done. They also want to get a special district. So some of the sales taxes generated go back to the stadium district. So they're going to get a sweet deal, even though we're going to call it something different. Allegiant, we raised room rate or room taxes. We seem desperate to get these teams. So all the, all we have left is the NBA to come. I guess Major League Soccer. All net, baby. Uh, some other ones. Yeah, yeah all net arena <laughs> is still uh, got to get that uh, shovel in the ground so we can get the NBA team there. I still, like, you think NBA would have been the easiest because you have T-Mobile. There, everybody does multi-use arenas. I know for whatever reason, NBA doesn't want that, which is stupid. And they could have just moved a team right in. Would have had no time. They could have started it next season. Uh, it was just blows my mind that that's the one that's the holdup. But let us know what you guys think about any of these stories. The Tiki Bar, of course, the A's in Vegas. Bats at the airport. Did you know that those existed? Uh, hit us up in the comments. We do two shows a week, Tuesdays and Fridays. And we'll be back in just a few days with another show. Thanks so much for watching. Talk to you next time. Have a good weekend, everybody.